for the first time in history, the sky is a battlefield. In World War I, brutal air combat with wood and canvas biplanes forges a new kind of warrior. The dogfighter. In the freezing air at 15,000 feet, these fearless pilots duel to the death in dizzying aerobatic combat. Now, you're in the cockpit as the first dogfighters invent aerial warfare. Experience the battle. Dissect the tactics. Relive the dogfights of World War I. June 1917, 15,000 feet above La Selle, France, on the Western Front. A lone Albatross D-3 hunts for enemy reconnaissance aircraft and observation balloons. An icy 100 mile per hour wind stings exposed skin as the pilot searches the sky. He is 21-year-old Ernst Udet, destined to become a top German ace second only to Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron. Here's someone who, by his own admission, had no qualms whatsoever about going head-to-head -head with an opponent in the interest of making the opponent flinch first. Not long into the mission, Odette spots something. From the west, a small dot approaches fast. At first, small and black, it grows quickly as it approaches. A spad, an enemy fighter. The aircraft has the distinctive brown markings and stub nodes of a French Spad 7. The adversaries close head on. At the same height, we go for each other, passing at a hair's breadth. We bank into a left turn, then begins the circling. Odette yanks the stick back and applies rudder. The simple but responsive cable and pulley controls snap the biplane into a tight bank. Like heavyweight boxers, the opponents test each other's defenses, holding back aggressive moves until they determine their enemy's skill. It wasn't the first pass that really gave them the initial insight into how good of an opponent they were facing. It was the first turn. The technological advantages of fighter aircraft in World War I weren't in the normal vertical flight pass. It was the turn. How quickly did the guy turn? How quickly could he recover? How much altitude could he gain in the turn without stalling the aircraft? The Albatross D-3, flown by Ernst Udet, is a fast climbing and maneuverable fighter that dominated the Allies when first sent into combat. The French-built Spad 7 is sturdy. With a 150 horsepower Hispano Suiza V8 engine and a top speed of 119 miles per hour, the Spad is 10 miles per hour faster than the Albatross and better in a dive. But the D3 is more maneuverable and has a better rate of climb. He'll attempt a half loop, one of the first air combat maneuvers later named for German ace Max Immelmann. Udet will pull back on the stick, climb, go inverted, then roll out at the top, hoping to surprise Guinemer with a diving attack. Odette pitches up, craning his neck around to keep his eyes on Guinemer. To his horror, the French ace has anticipated his move perfectly and fires into Odette's machine. Metallic hail rattles through my right wing plane and rings out as it strikes the struts. Odette reacts through sheer instinct, choking back the panic while struggling to regain the advantage.
Drive your car at 60 miles an hour down the highway. Stick your head out the window. Now imagine you're going twice that fast. Now imagine it's zero degrees outside and it's hard to breathe and it's cold and the air is botting. Throw in the fact that your seat is on top of a 20 gallon tank full of aviation gas. That's what it was like in a World War I fighter plane cockpit. Boudet rolls and reverses. The tight turning radius of the D3 plays to his advantage. He manages to get Guinevere in front of him for a fleeting moment. I'm sure he's coming down with the fangs out, blood in the mouth, and he's coming down to kill. I push the button on the stick, and the machine gun remains silent. Stoppage. His twin 7.92 millimeter Spandau machine guns are jammed. It's a common problem for the first dogfighters. The gun jam is a huge problem. They can't put any weapon on the enemy at that point, and then they're a sitting duck. Odette frantically pounds the gun, trying to clear the jam. It's no use. At that point, he was just a target for Guinemer. So he was doing a lot more wider circling, a lot more climbing, trying to stall the plane, doing things that were much more evasive. Boudet and Guinemer roll right and pull into each other again. With his left hand, Boudet tries to work the round through his machine gun. But then, disaster. From overhead, Guinemer observes the Germans' plight. Now he knows what gives with me. He knows I'm helpless prey. Boudet cranks over into another left turn. He has no cockpit armor. He has no parachute. To be shot down from this altitude in World War I is certain death. Guinemer reverses for a final climactic head-on pass. Odette knows it is about to end. He skims over me, almost on his back. Then it happens. He sticks out his hand and waves to me, waves lightly and dives to the west in the direction of his lines. I fly home. I'm numb. Incredibly, Georges Guinemer has spared Ernst Udet. There are people who claim Guinemer had a stoppage himself then. Others claim he feared I might ram him in desperation, but I don't believe any of them. I still believe to this day that a bit of chivalry from the past has continued to survive. Pilots like Ernst Rudet and Georges Guinemer had benefited tremendously from technological improvements that had taken place in the three years since the start of the war. World War I started 11 years after the Wright brothers flew at Kitty Hawk. When the conflict began, the aircraft that were used were nothing but glorified kites, powered with today what wouldn't even be a decent motorcycle engine. Air combat first developed around observation aircraft sent into enemy airspace to spot artillery or track troop movements. Smaller aircraft, called scouts in World War I, were designed to attack these reconnaissance planes. Essential to this mission was the use of forward-firing machine guns, first added to scout planes in 1915. For the first time, you can use the airplane as a platform. You point your airplane at your target and fire. And so it's far more accurate than trying to fire to the side or behind or that sort of thing enemy soon sent up their own scout planes to protect the reconnaissance aircraft, 
And by the winter of 1915, dogfights became a fixture in the skies of World War I. German ace Werner Voss is a master of this new form of combat, racking up 48 kills by the fall of 1917. September 23, 1917. Werner Voss, flying a prototype Fokker triplane, wings into battle over the Ypres salient in Belgium. 15 miles to the southwest, six British SE-5s patrol the skies over the front. Soon, they will meet Werner Voss in battle. He will pit his Fokker triplane against the very best of the British Royal Flying Corps in one of the most famous dogfights of World War I. September 23, 1917. Six British SE-5 fighters cruise over the Western Front near Houghton, Belgium. The SE-5s are B-flight of 56 Squadron. They are led by Captain James McCutton, Britain's Ace of Aces. B-flight descends through a thick overcast at 9,000 feet. Below the clouds, unseasonably warm, humid air whips through their open cockpits. They were looking for either fighter aircraft from the opposing side or to find an observation aircraft that was trying to take pictures on their side. Black bursts menacingly around them. The first anti-aircraft guns were nothing but field artillery modified to fire vertically. The cut quickly spots a German DFW, a two-seat reconnaissance aircraft. The German is below B-flight and directly in front. McCutton pitches over into a dive to make a lightning-quick attack run. At 50 yards, he opens fire with a Lewis machine gun mounted on the top wing. The DFW's engine is hit hard. It drops out of the sky. But as B-Flight pulls up, McCutton spots something in the distance. We saw ahead of us, just above Polkapel, an SC half spinning down, closely pursued by a silvery-blue German triplane at very close range. The SE-5's tormentor is German ace Werner Voss. fires a burst into the British plane. B-Flight looks on. The wounded SE-5 trails thick black smoke as Foss engages a second SE-5. Effortlessly, the triplane pitches up, wings over, and drops onto the SE-5's tail. With 56 Squadron looking on from above, the triplane has made quick work of two SE-5s. Foss's Fokker triplane is a prototype aircraft, though slower than most fighters on the front. Its three wings give it astonishing maneuverability. McCutton and 56 Squadron Scout Experimental 5A, or SE-5A, operational in May 1917, is easy to fly and an extremely stable gun platform. Both planes are heavily armed with two machine guns. The SE-5, with a top speed of 130 miles per hour, is faster than the Fokker, but the Fokker is more maneuverable. B-Flight is now above and behind Foss, in perfect attack position. McCudden and Rhys Davids will lead the attack. Keith K. Muspratt and VP Cronin will follow. The remaining two members of B-Flight stay up high as top cover. McCudden signals the attack by rocking his wings. And it was at that point that one of the epic dogfights of World War I began. Down we dived at colossal speed, 
I went to the right, Rhys Davids to the left, and we got behind the German triplane together. Confident of an easy kill, McCudden and Rhys Davids open up. But Foss is anything but an easy target. He's been trained in the Dick de Volca, the first codified air combat tactics laid down in 1916 by German ace Oswald Volker. Rule 5 states you should always turn into your enemy's attack and put him on the defensive. Foss will boot hard right rudder and spin his machine around 180 degrees. The bizarre maneuver takes advantage of the triplane's stunning agility. The German pilot saw us and turned in the most disconcertingly quick manner. Not a climbing nor Immelmann turn, but a sort of flat half spin. The DR-1 triplane, having three wings, had an exceptional amount of lift to it. What it allowed the triplane to do was to basically do what's called a flat half spin or an uncoordinated turn. The SE-5s face a torrent of tracers. McCudden and Rhys Davids pull into a steep climb called Zooming in World War I. But Cronin's SE-5 is sluggish. He drops below Foss, his engine sputtering. McCudden, Rhys Davids, and Muspratt are here, above Foss. Cronin is below the fight easy prey for the German ace. Foss reverses and attacks Cronin. Cronin's sputtering engine coughs to life. He now turns directly into Foss and opens fire at 300 feet. Foss breaks off his attack but he's not running away, even if it's four against one. Cronin takes on a role in the battle at this point, not unlike a matador. He is deciding to stay in the fight and to stay ahead of Voss and to act as a distraction. Cronin is thrown from side to side within the open cockpit. I don't know how many times I got in a burst head on, then dived in under him while all the while he was drilling at and into me. Damn it, why didn't the others take him on? Did they think I was showing off? Above the fight, McCudden circles, looking for an opening. McCudden will wait for Foss to expose his six o'clock, then dive in and attack. Foss turns after Cronin. McCudden pitches down. He opens up with his Vickers machine gun. But in the blink of an eye, Foss reverses, returning fire with his twin Spandaus. McCutton hurtles past, then Zoom climbs. Foss maneuvers bravely in spite of the odds. In a group combat like that, when it's one against four, the best place to be is in the middle of everybody else. Because they're circling around you trying to maneuver, but they have to be careful, A, they don't shoot each other, or B, they don't crash into each other. But McCutton is determined. He again noses over. No sooner do McCutton's guns spark to light than Foss pulls his nose to bear. Hot German lead tears through McCutton's SE-5, shredding fabric and wooden wing spars. Foss appears invincible at the controls of the triplane. The airplanes of that era were creatures of the air. You felt every input that you gave to the controls. You had cable connections to the ailerons, the rudder, the elevators. Not at all like today where we have fly-by-wire jets where you move a control stick an eighth of an inch and you get uh, a knife-edge flight all of a sudden. 
boss's mastery of his machine finally catches up to BP Chrono. His SE-5 has taken severe damage. He finally got too close to me, and I, I resorted in desperation to the old method of shaking a pursuing machine. He puts his aircraft into something that looks like a spin, almost as if he's either been incapacitated or the aircraft has been somehow disabled. After a couple of revolutions, it appears that Voss actually buys it and lets him fly away. Voss has knocked three SE-5s out of the fight and landed hits on any British pilot who's approached him. But now, three more SE-5s of 56 Squadron join the fray. A startling array of pilots now surround Werner Foss, all British aces. The light and agile triplane could easily climb above the combat and escape, but Foss savors the thrill of the dogfight. The German ace is destined for glory or death. September 23, 1917. In the midst of a wild melee, famed German ace Werner Foss holds his own against no less than six top British aces. Foss savors the combat, superbly demonstrating the lethal effectiveness of his prototype Fokker triplane. His stick and throttle ability, his ability to fly it in a disciplined way in a fight, his ability to stay, not calm, but to keep his wits about him in these very stressful situations. If he were flying with us today, he'd probably be one of the best. British SE-5 pilot Richard Mayberry now zeroes in on Foss. Diving on him from 6 o'clock. Foss breaks right to shake him off. But Mayberry is not thrown. At this point in the battle, things get very complicated and very confused. An albatross joins the battle, which of course helps Voss considerably, at least numerically. A German albatross D3 has stumbled into the action, turning easily onto Mayberry's tail. Mayberry zoom climbs to shake the albatross. A German pilot gives chase. But even worse, Foss latches on as well. Flying nearby, James McCutton and Arthur Rhys Davids move in behind the Germans. And for a moment, the battle is transformed into a wild, twisting tail chase. The Germans are sandwiched between the British. The Albatross pitches up, zooms, then drops in behind McCutton and Reese Davids. The German yanks the stick back. The gut-churning loop puts him squarely behind the British. Unfortunately for Reese Davids, the Albatross manages to unload his guns into his airplane. But Reese Davids stays in the fight, the Albatross still on his tail. Now, at the head of the chase, Richard Mayberry will pitch up and loop back on the tail of the red-nosed albatross. Mayberry yanks the stick back, throwing his SE-5 into a dizzying acrobatic maneuver. He fires from point-blank range. The wounded albatross plummets. Voss is alone once again. He zooms, distancing himself from the slower climbing SE-5s. Voss looks down at the plane circling below. He could easily disengage and live to fight another day. But the enticement of the kill runs hot through his veins. I think actually he got greedy and he was looking at an opportunity to notch number 49 and number 50. 
and furthermore to close the gap on his friend and rival Manfred von Richthofen. Boss dives back into the fray. He fires his Spandau machine guns into the nearest SE-5. Its engine pummeled. The British pilot dives out of the fight. The dogfight rages above no man's land. Foss handles the triplane superbly, pumping rounds into each of the attacking SE-5s. But it isn't enough. The thing that's unfortunate for Voss is that he never really put enough planes out of commission to, to, to gain any sort of advantage. All the bullets he put into all those planes, he never drew a drop of blood from any of those opponents. To the British, Voss seems invulnerable. The triplane was still circling round in the midst of six SEs who were all firing at it as opportunity offered. And at one time I noted the triplane in the apex of a cone of tracer bullets from at least five machines simultaneously, and each machine had two guns. The British are dumbstruck by the skill and tenacity of the German pilot in the Marco triplane. Werner Foss's luck is about to run out. Foss is here. British ace James McCutton is here. They'll streak in, head on. But Foss doesn't see another SE-5 coming in from the side. The SE-5 on the side watches the merge. Then opens fire. Rounds slam into the triplane's cockpit and fuselage. Boss stays aloft, but for the first time in the battle, he takes no evasive action. Then, Arthur Reese David dives on Foss from behind. He empties his Vickers machine guns into the triplane. Boss does little to avoid the deadly arc of bullets. Given how much he straightened up and how the ferociousness of his maneuvering had, had abated, that he was wounded and he was probably starting to have some difficulty uh, maintaining consciousness. Reese Davids fires another burst into the triplane, then pulls up. James McCutton is the only pilot to witness Foss's final moments. When I next saw him, he was very low. I saw him go into a fairly steep dive, and so I continued to watch. And then saw the triplane hit the ground and disappear into a thousand fragments. For it seemed to me that it literally went to powder. After 10 minutes of ferocious combat, Werner Foss is dead at age 20. The German ace shot holes through every plane that attacked him, but incredibly, all returned to base. As long as I live, I shall never forget my admiration for that German pilot. His flying was wonderful, his courage magnificent. And in my opinion, he is the bravest German airman who it has been my privilege to see fight. German pilots and planes were always on the cutting edge of tactics and technology. They were a formidable foe for the Americans who took to the skies above France in 1918. The United States Army Air Service was equipped and trained by the French. Though some pilots had flown in the French Lafayette Escadrille early in the war, most had no combat experience. America's first dogfighters will be tested as never before. September 14, 1918, Mars Latour, France. American pilot Arthur Raymond Brooks, in a formation of six SPAD 13s, patrols over the Western Front. 
Soon, they spot three formations of German Fokker D7s in the distance. The Americans move in. Instinctively, Brooks checks six and sees a formation of 12 enemy Fokkers. I saw them as they neared us, but had no time to warn the leader of our flight, other than by just nosing down, gaining speed, and then turning to the right, over his head, and into the Fokkers. Brooks's abrupt maneuver separates him from his flight. Four of the German planes continue on to attack the rest of the Spads. But eight stay to fight the lone American. The sky explodes to a furious and deadly contest. September 14, 1918. American pilot Arthur Raymond Brooks wings straight into the fight of his life. He's surrounded by eight German Fokker D7s. I was scared, but in spite of much high tension and yelling at the top of my voice, I calculated, by the nature of my training, I suppose, that I would get as many Fokkers as possible before the inevitable. Brooks is up against a lethal adversary, the Fokker D7. It is 100% universally felt that the Fokker D-7 was the best fighter aircraft of World War I. It had a wing that was thick, which allowed it to maneuver very quickly. Brooks's SPAD-13, with a 220-horsepower Hispano Suiza 8BC engine and a top speed of 138 miles per hour, is sturdy but plagued with engine problems. Both planes are armed with two forward-firing machine guns. The SPAD is faster and better in a dive, but the Fokker D-7 is more agile in a turning fight. Brooks initiates violent evasive maneuvers, skidding, looping, and diving, anything to prevent the circling Fokkers from getting a clean shot. In the heat of the fight, Brooks was probably alternating between panic and the coolness of desperation. His mind was fixed on a number of things at once. Adrenaline surges as he fights to stay alive amid the chaos of swirling airplanes. Suddenly, one Fokker dives towards him in a head-on pass. Desperate to save fuel and ammunition, Brooks heads directly at the Fokker intent on ramming the German. It seems like a real dramatic last-ditch move. No telling what damage you're going to inflict on your own airplane or something like that. Just before impact, the German peels under and dives away. reverses. To survive, he must keep moving. Another Fokker pours in head on. Brooks speeds by. I turned immediately on another, feeling that a vigorous offense was the best defense. Brooks is here. A Fokker is firing on him here. In this kind of dogfight, Brooks must take a shot at every opportunity. As the German dives on him, Brooks will skid out of the stream of bullets. Then, when the Fokker passes underneath, Brooks will roll over the top of his enemy and bring his guns to bear. The German bores in. Brooks pulls hard back on the stick. The SPAD leaps skyward. I had just enough time to dip enough to see his features before I fired incendiaries, and he was a flame.
All he had to do was pull himself across without having to slow down or align fuselage. He could rake his gun right across the plane. It's a brilliant move. Brooks's two 303 caliber Vickers make quick work of the Fokker. One down, but he's facing seven more. Brooks spots a Fokker at two o'clock, starting a pass. And out of his peripheral vision, he realized, and you believe me, he realized these things in a nanosecond, that the geometry to, to rake somebody else was right there. Brooks cranks to the right and peppers the Fokker with machine gun fire. Two down. But knocking the Hun aircraft down may play to Brooks's disadvantage. It was being surrounded that saved me thus far. The Germans could not shoot at me without being in their own way most of the time, or bringing one of their own aircraft into the line of fire. The Germans just saw two of their squadron mates go down. They're angrier now. In terms of flying more aggressively, I'm sure it's like, uh, we're gonna finish this SLB right now. The six other Fokkers thrown in like angry hornets, determined to knock the span out of the sky. September 14, 1918. American pilot Arthur Raymond Brooks